Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems, the ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? What is this strange thing, this strange idea, this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, and this is a podcast intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off for 3 a.m.? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night, or sometimes background noise or simply company. That's why I make these episodes quite long so that I'm here for you without any pressure of the end coming. Now, as far as I know, there are a couple of different ways to engage with the show. The primary idea is that gives you something to focus on, a story or an event that lets you keep your mind on a specific point to stop it from spinning out into stress and anxieties, to focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep when it comes for you. But maybe you need something different. Maybe you just need some kind of background noise. People these days sometimes like some kind of white noise or the sound of rain or wind in the trees or the sound of the ocean. Or maybe just some boring dude droning on in the background. But as you listen, don't try to force to sleep. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of the story and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Obviously I'm hoping you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it's important that you don't feel pressurized. If this is your first night with us, it probably actually won't work for you. It'll probably take you a solid three nights of trying. That's my experience and the experience of most people I've spoken to. To get over the idea, to get used to listening to something deliberately when you go to sleep. Maybe just to get used to my accent. And it's also possible, especially early on, that one episode isn't long enough. Or maybe even you don't have any trouble going to sleep, but maybe you wake up in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m. What I recommend in those, both of those cases actually is download a whole bunch of episodes into your podcast player of choice, put them all in a playlist, and then when you go to bed, hit play and let them go. That way when you wake up in the, at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night and find yourself staring at the ceiling, you can just carry on listening and go straight back down again. And you can even do the same thing if you find yourself waking up before your alarm, 60 minutes or as little as 30 minutes. And you can ask me, Dave, what's the point of an extra 30 minutes of sleep? But I've got to tell you that there is something about allowing yourself complete relaxation right before the alarm. That's satisfying on a whole new, deep level. So as you listen, try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this will probably seem strange, so give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you. To create a safe space. A cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course you aren't hearing me, 
except maybe in a dream. Before we get on with the show, I'd like to ask for a couple of minutes of your time. I haven't mentioned in a while that I left my job to focus full-time on podcast editing and production, and to spend some more time at home with the family after a lifetime of working in the hospitality business and working holidays and weekends. So if you or someone you know would like to start a podcast, or has one but you're struggling to get everything done, I can do most of the editing and admin tasks for you, including taking control of the full podcast launch, which is something I'm actually helping someone with at the moment, registering in all of the dozen or so places you need to be to have an optimal launch. So get in touch at my email in the episode notes for a free consultation, and I'll get you going in the right direction. And we can see how I can take the pressure off you so you can focus on the fun stuff, or spend your time doing more interesting things than audio editing and podcast admin. And if you'd be more inclined to just give a little bit, give a little bit of direct support to help me keep things going and help me keep CB Time Tales up and running, the best thing to do is sign up on the Patreon. That's at patreon.com slash sleepytimetales. This is monthly support that helps me keep the lights on and gets you fun bonuses based on your contribution level. From as little as $2 a month, you get some cool bonuses. But if monthly seems a big ask, there is also the um, once-off tips to the tip jar on the website. And there's also merchandise on the Tee Public store, which is, there's some cool stuff up there. A lot of it isn't even Sleepy Time Tales branded, but there's some fun designs that I've put up that you can help, use to help support me and the show without even having to explain to people what Sleepy Time Tales is. But speaking of telling people about Sleepy Time Tales, another huge way to help is simply to spread the word. If you know someone who's struggling to sleep, just tell them about Sleepy Time Tales and let them give it a try. And if you do tell people on social media, make sure to tag me in at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter so that I can see and I can say thanks. And last, of course, I've got to shout out the music, which is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiku. The music is available on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com. Thanks for taking the time. Let's get back to the show. We return this week to description of a new world called the Blazing World by Duchess Margaret of Cavendish. Then the Empress asked them the reason why the sun and moon did often appear in different postures or shapes, as sometimes magnified, sometimes diminished, sometimes elevated, otherwise depressed. Now thrown to the right and then to the left. To which some of the birdmen answered that it proceeded from the various degrees of heat and cold which are found in the air from whence did follow a different density and rarity, and likewise from the vapours that are interposed, whereof those that ascend are higher and less dense than the ambient air, but those which descend are heavier and more dense. But others did with more probability affirm that it was nothing else but the various patterns of the air. For like as painters do not copy out one and the same original, just alike at all times, so, said they, do several parts of the air make different patterns of the luminous bodies of the sun and moon, which patterns, as several copies, the sensitive motions do figure out in the substance of our eyes. This answer the Empress liked much better than the former, and inquired further, what opinion they had of the creatures that are called the motes of the sun? to which they answered, that there were nothing else but streams of very small, rare and transparent particles, through which the sun was represented as though a glass. For if they were not transparent, said they, they would eclipse the light of the sun. And if not rare and of an airy substance, they would hinder flies from the flying in the air, at least retard their flying motion. Nevertheless, although they were thinner than the thinnest vapour, yet were they not so thin as the body of air, 
or else they would not be perceptible by animal sight. Then the Empress asked whether they were living creatures. They answered yes, because they did increase and decrease, and were nourished by the presence and starved by the absence of the sun. Thus, having finished their discourse of the sun and moon, the Empress desired to know what stars there were besides. But they answered that they could perceive in that world none other but blazing stars. And from thence it had the name that it was called, the blazing world. And these blazing stars, said they, were such solid, firm and shining bodies as the sun and moon. Not of a globular, but of several sorts of figures. Some had tails, and some other kinds of shapes. After this, the Empress asked them what kind of substance or creature the air was. The birdmen answered that they could have no other perception of the air but by their own respiration. Or said they some bodies are only subject to touch, others only to sight, and others only to smell. But some are subject to none of our exterior senses. For nature is so full of variety that our weak senses cannot perceive all the various sorts of her creatures. Neither is there any one object perceptible by all our senses. No more than several objects are by one sense. I believe you, replied the Empress. But if you can give no account of the air, said she, you will hardly be able to inform me how wind is made. For they say that wind is nothing but motion of the air. The birdman answered that they observed wind to be more dense than air, and therefore subject to the sense of touch. But what properly wind was, and the manner how it was made, they could not exactly tell. Some said it was caused by the clouds falling on each other and others that it was produced of a hot and dry exhalation, which ascending was driven down again by the coldness of the air that is in the middle region, and by reason of its lightness could not go directly to the bottom, but was carried by the air up and down. Some would have it a flowing water of the air, and others again a flowing air, moved by the blaze of the stars. But the Empress, seeing that they could not agree concerning the cause of wind, asked whether they could tell how snow was made. To which they answered that according to their observation, snow was made by a commixture of water and some certain extract of the element of fire that is under the moon. A small portion of which extract, being mixed with water and beaten by air or wind, made a white froth called snow which being after some while dissolved by the heat of the same spirit, turned to water again. This observation amazed the Empress very much, for she had hitherto believed that snow was made by cold motions, and not by such an agitation or beating of a fiery extract upon water. Nor could she be persuaded to believe it until the fish or mermen had delivered their observation upon the making of ice which they said was not produced, as some hitherto conceived, by the motion of the air raking the superficies of the earth, but by some strong saline vapour arising out of the seas, which condensed water into ice. And the more quantity there was of that vapour, the greater were the mountains of precipices of ice. But the reason that it did not so much freeze in the torrid zone, or under the ecliptic, as near or under the poles, was that this vapour in those places being drawn up by the sunbeams into the middle region of the air, was only condensed into water, and fell down in showers of rain, when as under the poles the heat of the sun being not so vehement, the same vapour had no force or power to rise so high, and therefore caused so much ice, by ascending and acting only upon the surface of water. 
This relation confirmed partly the observation of the birdmen concerning the cause of snow. But since they made mention that that extract, which by its commixture with water made snow, proceeded from the element of fire, that is under the moon, the empress asked them of what nature that elementary fire was, whether it was like ordinary fire here upon earth, or such fire as is within the bowels of the earth, and as the famous mountains of Vesuvius and Etna do burn withal, and whether it was such a sort of fire as is found in flints, etc. They answered that the elementary fire, which is underneath the sun, was not so solid as any of those mentioned fires, because it had no solid fuel to feed on, but yet it was much like the flame of ordinary fire, only somewhat more thin and fluid. For flame, said they, is nothing else but the airy part of a fired body. Lastly, the empress asked the birdmen of the nature of thunder and lightning, and whether it was not caused by the roves of ice falling upon each other. To which they answered that it was not made that way, but by an encounter of cold and heat, so that an exhalation being kindled in the clouds did dash forth lightning, and that there were so many rentings of clouds as there were sounds and crackling noises. But this opinion was contradicted by others, who affirmed that thunder was a sudden and monstrous blaze, stirred up in the air, and it did not always require a cloud. But the empress, not knowing what they meant by blaze, for even they themselves were not able to explain the sense of this word, liked the former better. And to avoid hereafter tedious disputes, and have the truth of the phenomenon of celestial bodies be more exactly known, commanded the bear men, which were her experimental philosophers, to observe them through such instruments as are called telescopes, which they did according to her majestic command. But these telescopes caused more differences and divisions amongst them than ever they had before. For some said they perceived that the sun stood still and the earth did move about it. Others were of opinion that both did move. And others said again that the earth stood still and the sun did move. Some counted more stars than others. Some discovered new stars never seen before. Some fell into a great dispute with others concerning the bigness of the stars. Some said the moon was another world like their terrestrial globe, and the spots therein were hills and valleys. But others would have the spots to be the terrestrial parts, and the smooth and glossy parts, the sea. At last the empress commanded them to go with her telescopes to the very end of the pole that was joined to the world she came from, and try whether they could perceive any stars in it, which they did and being returned to Her Majesty, reported that they had seen three blazing stars appear there, one after another in a short time, whereof two were bright and one dim. But they could not agree neither in this observation, for some said it was but one star which appeared at three several times, in several places, and others would have them be three several stars for they thought it impossible that those three several appearances could have been but one star, because every star did rise at a certain time, and appeared in a certain place, and did disappear in the same place. Next, it is altogether improbable, said they, that one star should fly from place to place, especially at such a vast distance, without a visible motion, in so short a time, and appear in such different places, whereof two were quite opposite, and the third sideways. Lastly, if it had been but one star, said they, it would have always kept the same splendour, which it did not. 
for as above mentioned, two were bright and one was dim. After they had thus argued, the Empress began to grow angry at their telescopes, that they could give no better intelligence. For, said she, now I do plainly perceive that your glasses are false informers, and instead of discovering the truth, delude your senses. Wherefore I command you to break them, and let the birdmen trust only to their natural eyes, and examine celestial objects by the motions of their own sense and reason. The bear men replied that it was not the faults of their glasses which caused them such differences in their opinions, but the sensitive motions in their optic organs did not move alike, nor were their rational judgments always regular. To which the empress answered that if their glasses were true informers, they would rectify their irregular sense and reason. But, said she, Nature has made your sense and reason more regular than art has your glasses, for they are mere deluders and will never lead you to the knowledge of truth. Therefore I command you again to break them, for you may observe the progressive motions of celestial bodies with your natural eyes better than through artificial glasses. The bare men being exceedingly troubled at Her Majesty's displeasure concerning their telescopes, kneeled down and in the humblest manner petitioned that they might not be broken. For, said they, we take more delight in artificial delusions than in natural truths. Besides, we shall want employments for our senses and subjects for arguments. For were there nothing but truth and no falsehood, there would be no occasion to dispute. And by this means we should want the aim and pleasure of our endeavours in confuting and contradicting each other. Neither would one man be thought wiser than another, but all would either be alike knowing and wise, or all would be fools. Wherefore we most humbly beseech your imperial majesty to spare our glasses, which are our only delight, and as dear to us as our lives. The Empress at last consented to their request, but upon condition that their disputes and quarrels should remain within their schools, and cause no factions or disturbances in state or government. The bare men, full of joy, returned their most humble thanks to the Empress, and to make her amends for the displeasure which their telescopes had occasioned, told Her Majesty that they had several other artificial optic glasses which they were sure would give Her Majesty a great deal more satisfaction. Amongst the rest, they brought forth several microscopes, by the means of which they could enlarge the shapes of little bodies, and make her louse appear as big as an elephant, and a mite as big as a whale. First of all, they showed the Empress a grey drone flower, wherein they observed that the greatest part of her face nay of her head, consisted of two large bunches all covered over with a multitude of small pearls or hemispheres in a trigonal order, which pearls were of two degrees, smaller and bigger, the smaller degree was lowermost, and looked towards the ground, the other was upward and looked sideward, forward and backward. They were all so smooth and polished that they were able to represent the image of any object. The number of them was in all 14,000. After the view of this strange and miraculous creature, and their several observations upon it, the Empress asked them what they judged those little hemispheres might be. They answered that each of them was a perfect eye. By reason they perceived that each was covered with a transparent cornea, containing a liquor within them which resembled the watery or glassy humour of the eye. To which the Empress replied that there might be glassy pearls and yet not eyes, that perhaps their microscopes did not truly inform them. But they smilingly answered Her Majesty that she did not know the virtue of these microscopes, 
for they never delude, but rectify and inform the senses, nay the world, said they would be blind without them. And as it has been in former ages before those microscopes were invented. After this they took a charcoal, and viewing it with one of their best microscopes, discovered in it an infinite multitude of pores, some bigger, some less, so close and thick that they left but very little space betwixt them, to be filled with a solid body, and to give her imperial majesty a better assurance thereof, they counted in a line of them an inch long, no less than two thousand seven hundred pores, from which observation they drew this following conclusion, to wit, that they, a body that has so many pores, from each of which no light is reflected, must necessarily look black, since black is nothing else but a privation of light or a want of reflection. But the Empress replied that if all colours were made by reflection of light, and that black was as much a colour as any other colour, then certainly they contradicted themselves in saying that black was made by want of reflection. However, not to interrupt your microscopical inspection, said she, let us see how vegetables appear through your glasses. Whereupon they took a nettle, and by the virtue of the microscope, discovered that underneath the points of the nettle there were certain little bags or bladders, containing a poisonous liquor, and when the points had made way into the interior parts of the skin, the like syringe pipes served to convey that same liquor into them. To which observation the Empress replied, that if there was such a poison in nettles, then certainly in eating of them, they would hurt us inwardly, as much as they do outwardly. But they answered that it belonged to physicians more than to experimental philosophers to give reasons hereof for they only made microscopical inspections and related the figures of the natural parts of creatures according to the representation of their glasses. Lastly, they showed the empress a flea and a louse, which the creatures through the microscope appeared so terrible to her sight that that almost put her into a swoon. The description of all their parts would be very tedious to relate, and therefore I'll forbear it at this present. The Empress, after the view of those strangely shaped creatures, pitied much those that are molested with them, especially poor beggars, which although they have nothing to live on themselves, are yet necessitated to maintain and feed of their own flesh and blood, a company of such terrible creatures called lice instead of thanks to reward them with pains and torment them for giving them nourishment and food. But after the Empress had seen the shapes of these monstrous creatures, she desired to know whether their microscopes could hinder their biting, or at least show some means how to avoid them. To which they answered that such arts were mechanical and below the noble study of microscopical observations. Then the Empress asked them whether they had not such sorts of glasses that could enlarge and magnify the shapes of great bodies as well as the head of little ones. Whereupon they took one of their best and largest microscopes and endeavoured to view a whale through it. But alas, the shape of the whale was so big that its circumference went beyond the magnifying quality of the glass. Whether the error proceeded from the glass, or from a wrong position of the whale against the reflection of light, I cannot certainly tell. The Empress, seeing the insufficiency of those magnifying glasses, that they were not able to enlarge all sorts of objects, asked the bare men whether they could not make glasses of a contrary nature to those they showed her to wit, such as instead of enlarging or magnifying the shape or figure of an object, or contract it beneath its natural proportion. Which, 
in obedience to Her Majesty's commands, they did. And veering through one of the best of them, a huge and mighty whale appeared no bigger than a sprat, nay, through some no bigger than a vinegar eel, and through their ordinary ones, an elephant seemed no bigger than a flea, a camel no bigger than a louse, and an ostrich no bigger than a mite. To relate all their optic observations through the several sorts of their glasses would be a tedious work and tie even the most patient reader. Wherefore, I'll pass them by. Only this was very remarkable and worthy to be taken notice of, that notwithstanding their great skill, industry and ingenuity and experimental philosophy, they could yet by no means contrive such glasses, by the help of which they could spy out a vacuum, with all its dimensions nor immaterial substances, Non beings and mixed beings, or such as are between something and nothing, which they were very much troubled at, hoping yet in time, by long and study and practice, they might perhaps attain to it. The bird and bear men being dismissed, the Empress called both the sirens or fishmen and the worm men to deliver their observations which they had made both within the seas and the earth. First she inquired of the fishmen whence the saltiness of the sea did proceed, to which they answered that there was a volatile salt in those parts of the earth, which as a bosom contained the waters of the sea, which salt, being imbibed by the sea, became fixed, and this imbibing motion was that they called the ebbing and flowing of the sea. For, said they, the rising and swelling of the water is caused by those parts of the volatile salt, as are not so easily imbibed, while striving to ascend above the water, bear it up with such a motion as man or some other animal creature, in a violent exercise uses to take breath. This they affirm to be a true cause both of the saltiness and the ebbing and flowing motion of the sea and not the jogging of the earth or the secret influence of the moon, as some others had made the world believe. After this, the Empress inquired whether they had observed that all animal creatures within the seas and other waters had blood. They answered that some had blood, more or less, but some had none. In crayfishes and lobsters, said they, we perceive but little blood. But in crabs, oysters, cockles, etc., none at all. Then the Empress asked them in what vein of their bodies that little blood did reside. They answered, in a small vein, which in lobsters went through the middle of their tails. But in crayfishes was found in their backs, as for other sorts of fishes. Some said they had only blood about their gills, and others in some other places of their bodies. But they had not as yet observed any whose veins did spread all over their bodies. The Empress, wondering that there could be any living animals without blood, to be better satisfied, desired the worm men to inform her whether they had observed blood in all sorts of worms. They answered that as much as they could perceive, some had blood and some not. A moth, they said, had no blood at all, and a louse had, but like a lobster, a little vein along her back. But replied the Empress, that if those mentioned creatures have no blood, how is it possible that they can live? For it is commonly said that the life of an animal consists in the blood, which is the seat of the animal's spirits. They answered that blood was not a necessary propriety to the life of an animal, and that which was commonly called animal spirits was nothing else but corporeal motions, proper to the nature and figure of an animal. Then she asked both the fishmen and wormmen whether all those creatures that have blood had a circulation of blood in their veins and arteries. 
but they answered that it was impossible to give Her Majesty an exact amount of thereof. By reason the circulation of blood was an interim motion, which their senses, neither of themselves, nor by the help of any optic instrument, could perceive. But as soon as they had dissected an animal creature and to find out the truth thereof, interior corporeal motions proper to that particular figure or creature were altered. Then said the Empress, If all animal creatures have not blood, it is certain that they all have neither muscles, tendons, nerves, etc. But said she, Have you ever observed animal creature? that are neither flesh nor fish, but of an intermediate degree between both. Truly answered both the fish and worm men, we have observed several animal creatures that live both in water and on the earth. Indifferently, and if any, certainly these may be said to be of such a mixed nature, that is, partly flesh and partly fish. But how it is possible, replied the Empress, that they should live both in water and on the earth, since those animals that live by the respiration of air cannot live within water, and those that live in water cannot live by the respiration of air, as experience doth sufficiently witness. They answered Her Majesty that as they were different sorts of creatures, so they had also different ways of respirations. For respiration, said they, is nothing else but a composition and division of parts, and the motions of nature being infinitely various, it is impossible that all creatures should have like motions. Wherefore it was not necessary that all animal creatures should be bound to live either by the air or by water only but according as nature had ordered it convenient to their species, the empress seemed very well satisfied with their answer, and desired to be further informed. Whether all animal creatures did continue their species by a successive propagation of particulars, and whether in every species the offsprings did always resemble their generator or producer, both in their interior and exterior figures, they answered Her Majesty that some species or sorts of creatures were kept up by a successive propagation of an offspring that was like the producer, but some were not. Of the first rank, said they, are all those animals that are of different sexes, besides several others. But of the second rank are for all the most part those we call insects whose production proceeds from such causes as we have no conformity or likeness with their produced effects. The Empress confessed that she observed nature was infinitely various in her works, and though the species of creatures did continue, yet their particulars were subject to infinite changes. But since you have informed me, said she, of the various sorts and productions of animal creatures, I desire you to tell me what you have observed of their sensitive perceptions. Truly answered they, Your Majesty puts a very hard question to us, and we shall hardly be able to give a satisfactory answer to it. For there are many different sorts of creatures, which, as they have all different perceptions, so they have also different organs, which our senses are not able to discover, only in an oyster shell, we have with admiration observed that the common sensorium of the oyster lies just as the closing of the shells, where the pressure and retraction may be perceived by the opening and shutting of the shells every tide. After all this, the Empress desired the worm men to give her a true relation how frost was made upon the earth, to which they answered, that it was made much after the manner and description of the fish and birdmen, concerning the congelation of water into ice and snow, by a commixture of Ceylon and acid particles, which relation added a great light to the ape men, who were the chemists, concerning their chemical principles, salt, sulfur, and mercury. 
But, said the Empress, if it be so, it will require an infinite multitude of Ceylon particles to produce such a great quantity of ice, frost and snow. Besides, said she, when snow, ice and frost turn again into their former principle, I would fain know what becomes of those Ceylon particles. But neither the worm men nor the fishmen and bird men could give her an answer to it. And with that mystery, I think I'm going to leave it for tonight. As always, you can pick this up where we've left off on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week but make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiku. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams.